Welcome to the Journal of Allergy Clinical Immunology in Practice podcast on the highlights from our May 2021 theme issue on allergen immunotherapy. I am Bob Zyga, Deputy Editor of Jackie in Practice, and am pleased to present the many important clinical messages from this issue. With respect to allergen immunotherapy, This issue has six review articles, three with CME credit, one special article, and five original articles. Allergen immunotherapy is the holy grail for allergists owing to its powers as the only disease-modifying treatment for allergic diseases such as asthma and allergic rhinitis. Clinicians now need to decide which of the present choices of immunotherapy to recommend for treatment, given the progress made in increasing the modes of immunotherapy from only subcutaneous immunotherapy, SCIT, with its discovery in 1911, to the many additional forms that exist today, including tablets for some legal immunotherapy, SLIT, capsules for oral immunotherapy for foods, and potentially patches for epicutaneous immunotherapy. We are especially appreciative of this issue's theme coordinators, Drs. Thomas Casale and Jean Bousquet, who in addition to expertly choosing the topics and authors for this theme issue, also co-authored an excellent theme editorial that highlights the importance and therapeutic benefits of allergen immunotherapy. The immunologic responses and biomarkers for allergen immunotherapy against inhaled allergens is extensively reviewed by Dr. Shamji and co-investigators in their CME clinical commentary review, which clearly summarize the immunologic mechanisms responsible for the success of allergen immunotherapy. In another CME clinical commentary review, Drs. Jensen Jarolim and colleagues masterfully discuss how allergens and adjuvants in allergen immunotherapy modulate the immune responses through immune activation, tolerance, and resilience. An historical journey from the birth of allergen immunotherapy in 1911 to its 110 year progress in 2021 and future promising advances is comprehensively presented in a CME clinical commentary by Drs. Farr and co-authors. In their insightful clinical commentary review, Drs. Bouquet and colleagues describe how mobile health technologies help in stratifying patients for starting and completing allergen immunotherapy from the perspectives of allergic rhinitis and its impact on asthma and European Academy of Allergology and Clinical Immunology groups. Prevention of allergic disease has been a long-term goal, but elusive challenge among allergists and immunologists. Doctors Gradman and Halkin provide in this detailed clinical commentary review the strong evidence that allergen immunotherapy may provide an effective avenue to the prevention of allergies and new allergen sensitizations. Given the more recent regulatory approaches for SLIT, Drs. Bacaria and Calderon, in a Controversies in Allergy article, provide a systematic and proficient review in a pro and con format of the benefits and safety of SLIT for asthma. Finally, in a special article, Dr. Wasserman and colleagues summarize the recent Canadian Society for Allergy and Clinical Immunology guidelines for food oral immunotherapy. Additionally, this review presents a consensus of clinical experiences in the United States and Canada dealing with patient selection, office and staff preparation, oral immunotherapy related reaction management, and treatment outcomes. I will now summarize the information from the original articles from the May issue. The next five articles are on immunotherapy. Hoshino et al. 
in an article entitled Serum Periastin as a Biomarker for Predicting Clinical Response to House Dust Mites Sublingual Immunotherapy in Allergic Rhinitis. What is already known about this topic? House Dust Mites Sublingual Immunotherapy, SLIT, is an effective treatment option for allergic rhinitis, but its efficacy varies across patients. To date, no validated biomarkers for the clinical response to SLIT are available. What does this article add to our knowledge? High serum periostin levels at enrollment predict clinical response to SLIT. And this value correlated with the magnitude of improvement in rhinoconjunctivitis quality of life. How does this study impact current management guidelines? This study highlights the importance of serum periostin as a biomarker of successful slit for patients with allergic rhinitis. Next article by Nolte et al. on the treatment effect of the tree pollen slit tablet on allergic rhinoconjunctivitis during oak pollen season. What is already known about this topic? Oak is a member of the birch homologous group and oak allergens is an important BETV1 cross-reactive tree pollen allergen, particularly in North America. What does this article add to our knowledge? The tree slit tablets improves allergic rhinoconjunctivitis symptoms and reduces symptom relieving medication use during oak pollen season in addition to perch pollen season and induces oak-specific immunologic responses. How does this study impact current management guidelines? The tree slit tablets may be used to treat oak-related allergic rhinoconjunctivitis symptoms and reduce the need for symptom-relieving pharmacology. Vickery et al. in a study entitled Continuous and Daily Oral Immunotherapy for Peanut Allergy results from a two-year open-label follow-on study. What is already known about this topic? The Phase 3 Palisade trial established the safety and efficacy of daily oral immunotherapy with peanut, Arrakis hapagea, allergen powder, abbreviated PTAH, over a one-year period in peanut allergic children and adolescents. What does this article add to our knowledge? This follow-up study, which explored long-term PDAH therapy and alternative dosing regimens, demonstrated a potential benefit with combined daily PTAH treatment beyond one year. How does this study impact current management guidelines? This study may help inform selection of oral immunotherapy dosing regimens and treatment duration in peanut allergic individuals. It also supports the overall favorable benefit risk profile of long-term oral immunotherapy with PTAH. Pelosuo et al in a randomized open-label trial of hen's egg oral immunotherapy, looked at the efficacy and humor responses in 50 children. What is already known about this topic? Oral immunotherapy is an experimental treatment for food allergy. Oral immunotherapy can successfully desensitize approximately 80% of children with persistent egg allergy. What does this article add to our knowledge? We describe an egg oral immunotherapy protocol able to desensitize up to 88% of children with moderate to severe allergic reactions to heated egg at double-blind placebo-controlled food challenge. High baseline egg white specific IgE and polysensitization to GAD-D14 relate with impaired responses. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Many patients with high egg white specific IgE levels and sensitization to multiple egg allergens achieve desensitization after prolonged treatment. In the next article, Mac et al. entitled The High 
proportion of Canadian allergists offer oral immunotherapy, but barriers remain. What is already known about this topic? Discussion of oral immunotherapy has historically centered around its readiness for clinical practice. Previous North American surveys have suggested a relatively low allergist uptake for oral immunotherapy with a desire for a standardized product and guidelines. What does this article add to our knowledge? Using survey data, we identify a, a relatively high proportion of Canadian allergists performing oral immunotherapy with multiple food products. Logistical and clinical barriers were identified related to the practice and evidence base of oral immunotherapy. How does the study impact current management guidelines? The implementation of oral immunotherapy faces many barriers. Increasing high quality data may encourage those hesitants to offer oral immunotherapy. Improving funding and training will help to expand access for allergists performing oral immunotherapy. We had one article on COVID in our May issue by Mustafa et al. entitled Patient Satisfaction with In-Person Video and Telephone Allergy Immunotherapy Evaluations During the COVID-19 Pandemic. What is already known about this topic? Patient satisfaction with remote visits during COVID-19 pandemic has previously been reported. What does this article add to our knowledge? This study demonstrates similar patient satisfaction among in-person, video, and telephone encounters, but shows that patients and physicians were most likely to report encounter completeness with in-person visits, especially with food allergy and chronic rhinitis. There was no difference between video and telephone encounter perception of completeness among patients and physicians. How does this study impact current management guidelines? This information can be immediately applied to scheduling patients in allergy immunology practices to optimize space, time, and safety during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have an article on allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis by Lee. It's entitled Biomarkers for the Diagnosis of Allergic Bronchopulmonary Aspergillosis and Cystic Fibrosis, a Systemic Review and Meta-Analysis. What is already known about this topic? Criteria to Diagnose Allergic Bronchopulmonary Aspergillosis ABPA and cystic fibrosis patients lacked specificity, leading to diagnostic delays. What does this article add to our knowledge? Specific immunoglobulin E against recombinant aspergillus fumigatus antigens F4 and F6 and hyperattenuating mucus on computed tomography scan demonstrate high specificity for diagnosing ABPA and cystic fibrosis. Newer biomarkers, such as thymus and activation regulated chemokine, CD203C basophil activation test, and inverted mucoid impaction signal on MRI, appear promising, but warrant further validation. How does this study impact current management guidelines? These biomarkers have the potential to supplement current ABPA diagnostic criteria to improve specificity in cystic fibrosis. There is one article on anaphylaxis entitled Trends in U.S. Emergency Department Visits for Anaphylaxis Among Infants and Toddlers 2006 to 2015 by Robinson et al. What is already known about this topic? Little is known about trends in emergency department visits and hospitalizations for anaphylaxis among infants and toddlers in the United States. What does this article add to our knowledge? Emergency department visits for anaphylaxis are rising over time, whereas the proportion hospitalized are declining. How does this study impact current management guidelines? 
These results suggest that declining hospitalizations among infants and toddlers with anaphylaxis is not due to a decline in the prevalence of anaphylaxis. We next have several original articles on asthma. The first by Hung et al. entitled Cost-Effectiveness of Teotropium in Elderly Patients with Severe Asthma Using Real-World Data. What is already known about this topic? Adding teotropium to the standard of care for patients with severe asthma showed significant improvements in preventing asthma exacerbations in adults. What does this article add to our knowledge? In elderly patients with severe asthma, adding teotropium resulted in a significant decrease in asthma exacerbation rates. In particular, it shows a higher cost effectiveness profile when applied to elderly patients whose symptoms are poorly controlled. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Our results provide information on the treatment effect of teotropium targeting elderly patients who are usually excluded from randomized controlled trials, thus, thus offering a basis for establishing reimbursement criteria of teotropium for elderly patients with severe asthma. Next is an article by Han Kamaki et al. entitled Asthma Remission by Age at Diagnosis and Gender in a Population-Based Study. What is already known about this topic? Age of asthma onset differentiates patients in many ways. Remission is common in child onset asthma, but seemingly less common in adult onset asthma. Risk factors of asthma persistence from childhood to adulthood are well described. What does this article add to our knowledge? In this study, age at asthma diagnosis after 40 years was the strongest risk factor of asthma non-remission. And age at diagnosis had a higher association with non-remission than current patient age or time from diagnosis. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Age at asthma diagnosis should be highlighted in the guidelines as a key indicator of asthma prognosis. Adequate follow-up and research resource allocation should be provided for adult onset, especially late adult onset asthma. The next article is the risk of rehospitalization and death in patients hospitalized due to asthma by Ekstrom et al. What is already known about this topic? Asthma causes considerable morbidity across the world. What does this article add to our knowledge? Rehospitalizations occurred in more than one of 10 patients with asthma. Few were seen by specialists and continuous inhaled corticosteroid use was rare. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Closer monitoring after asthma hospitalization is needed. The next article is factors associated with asthma severity in children. Data from the French Coprepeed cohort by Lesme et al. What is already known about this topic? Environmental factors and allergic disorders are associated with severity of pediatric severe asthma. What does this article add to our knowledge? We found that factors associated with asthma severity in children may differ according to age. In preschoolers, environmental factors are predominant, whereas allergic disorders are mainly involved at school age. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Our results highlight the need to explore household exposures, at least in preschoolers, and confirm the importance of controlling associated allergic disorders. Next, we have several articles on drug allergy. Benergy et al., an article entitled Perioperative Allergic Reactions, Allergy Assessment and Subsequent Anesthesia. What is already known about this topic? Perioperative allergic reactions are rare, but associated with significant morbidity. 
identification of the causative agents or agents after a perioperative allergic reaction is challenging. What does this article add to our knowledge? A comprehensive evaluation and management plan for perioperative allergic reactions in the United States requires testing for a broader group of causative agents than those routinely performed. How does this study impact current management guidelines? We devised an updated algorithmic approach to perioperative allergic reactions in the United States. Although a culprit was not identified in the majority of our cases, we provide guideline and guidance on subsequent management and safety data on subsequent anesthesia. To Ati et al. in their article entitled Cephalosporin Hypersensitivity, Descriptive Analysis, Cross-Reactivity, and Risk Factors is an important article. What is already known about this topic? Few large studies on cephalosporin hypersensitivity have been conducted compared with penicillins. There is no global consensus among professional societies regarding the necessary reagents, concentrations, or criteria for a positive result for cephalosporin skin tests. What does this article add to our knowledge? In our series, 22.3% of patients with a suspicion of cephalosporin hypersensitivity had the diagnosis confirmed. Non-immunologic hypersensitivity occurred in less than 10% of the positive patients. Half of the confirmed cases were identified by skin testing. The sensitivity was 51.9%, which led to systemic reactions in five cases, 1%, including two anaphylactic shots. Drug provocative testing confirmed the hypersensitivity in the remaining 47%, eliciting anaphylaxis in 2.3% of patients. How does the study impact current management guidelines? A comprehensive drug allergy workup allows us to confirm or rule out cephalosporin hypersensitivity. It needs expertise and a controlled environment. The next article is Piperacillin Tazobactam Hypersensitivity, a large multicenter analysis by Casimir Brown et al. What is already known about this topic? Piperacillin tazobactam causes both immediate and non-immediate hypersensitivity reactions. To date, only small case series or individual cases have been reported. What does this article add to our knowledge? Frequency of immediate and non-immediate hypersensitivity is similar. Reintroduction in a small group of skin test negative patients was tolerated by most. Selectively sensitized patients tolerate other penicillins. Cross-sensitization patients suggest allergy to tazobactam in a minority of patients. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Patients with selective piperacillin, tazobactam hypersensitivity, tolerate other penicillins, which must be included in skin testing panels. Drug provocation testing is safe in skin test negative patients. Tazobactam may be the allergen in some patients. The next article is the role of in vivo and ex vivo diagnostic tools in severe delayed immune mediated adverse antibiotic drug reactions by Kapuscu et al. What is already known about this topic? The use of ex vivo diagnostic tools for delayed Immunomediated adverse drug reactions has the advantage of carrying no risk of drug re-exposure for the patient, but is not available for routine diagnostic use in most centers. What does this article add to our knowledge? This study shows that a combination of in vivo, that's skin testing, and ex vivo, interfering gamma G release enzyme-linked immunospot assay, diagnostic tools, and severe delayed immune-mediated antibiotic adverse drug reactions improves causality assessment. 
in particular for drug reactions with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, glycopeptide-associated reactions. How does this study impact current management guidelines? Using in vivo in combination with ex vivo testing can enhance the diagnostic approach in severe phenotypes by assisting with the identification of possible culprit antibiotics. Next, we will summarize three articles on food allergy. The first by Santis et al. entitled, Basophil Activation Test Reduces Oral Food Challenges to Nuts and Sesame. What is already known about this topic? The introduction of nuts and seeds in the diet of children with one or more nut allergy is safe and feasible. However, because of polysensitization, this often requires multiple oral food allergy challenges. What does the article add to our knowledge? The basophil activation tests, BAT, when used after skin prick and specific IgE testing, can reduce the number of office food challenges, particularly positive challenges, maintaining very high diagnostic accuracy. How does the study impact current management guidelines? In children with one or more nut allergies, needing an office food challenge to clarify the allergic status to other nuts, a positive bat confirms allergy, where not, whereas a negative bat requires an office food challenge before recommending nut consumption or avoidance. The next article is entitled The Accuracy of Diagnostic Testing in Determining Tree Nut Allergy, a Systematic Review by Brete et al. What is already known about this topic? Sensitization to tree nuts is much greater than the rates of true clinical tree nut allergy. This may lead to increased oral food challenges, OFCs, which are often a limiting step in the diagnostic process. What does this article add to our knowledge? This study describes the diagnostic capacity of current clinical tests in determining tree nut allergy. 95% positive predictive values are identified in cashew and walnut. However, many tree nuts have limited diagnostic capacity and do not reduce the need for an oral food challenge. How does this study impact current management guidelines? This systematic review outlines the current strengths and limitations of the available diagnostic tests for tree nuts. These data may be used as a clinician reference when deciding on diagnostic testing in a clinical setting. The final article on food allergy is entitled Diagnostic Delay in Patients with Eosinophil Gastritis and or Duodenitis, a population-based study by Shahadi et al. What is already known about this topic? Eosinophil Gastritis and or Eosinophil Duodenitis is underdiagnosed. Patients with eosinophil gastritis and or eosinophil duodenitis present with symptoms that are similar to other gastrointestinal conditions. Detection of eosinophil gastritis and or eosinophil duodenitis requires esophagogastroduodenoscopy with biopsy and histopathologic evaluation. What does this article add to our knowledge? U.S. patients with eosinophil gastritis and or eosinophil duodenitis experience mean this diagnostic delay of 3.6 years, delayed gastrointestinal referral, delayed EGD testing, and lack of biopsy or histopathological analysis contributed to delay. Alternative diagnosis including functional disorders, were common and associated with delay. How does the study impact current management guidelines? Eosinophil gastritis, eosinophil duodenitis, should be considered in patients with gastrointestinal symptoms regardless of the presence of additional clinical features. Collection of multiple gastric and duodenal biopsies and counting of eosinophils during 
histopathologic evaluation may help avoid misdiagnosis. We had one article on immunodeficiency. It was entitled 10 Years of Newborn Screening for Severe Combined Immunodeficiency SCID in Massachusetts by Hale et al. What is already known about this topic? Universal newborn screening for severe combined immune deficiency SCID by measuring T cell receptor excision circles in dried blood spots has been successful in many states. And state specific short term outcomes, three to five years, have been reported. What does this article add to our current knowledge? Our detailed immunologic and 10 year data reveal that follow up of infants with T cells less than 2,500 cells per microliter and or low naive T cell percentage, both premature and term has high diagnostic yield. We present granular gestational age data. How does the study impact current management guidelines? Referring neonatal intensive care unit infants with out of range skid newborn screen results, regardless of gestational age and infants with mild lymphopenia, 1500 to 2500 cells per microliter, to immunologists is expected to lead to significantly improved outcomes for patients with SCID. In summary, this allergen immunotherapy theme issue should help clinicians better determine the optimal routes of allergen immunotherapy for their patients with a goal to enhance the quality of life of their patients through personalized medicine. Thank you for your attention and enjoy our May issue.